Did a runaway slave inspire the best-selling novel of the 19th century? And did that novel ignite flames of public sentiment that led to the Civil War? Find out as we explore the extraordinary life of Josiah Henson on this day of discovery. In 1880, Josiah Henson could sit on the porch of this cottage near Dresden, Ontario, and survey the surrounding farmland he had purchased with his own sweat and toil. With heartfelt gratitude, he could reflect on countless blessings for which he thanked God daily. More than anything else, Josiah thanked God that he was a free man, because that had not always been the case. Josiah Henson's story is a remarkable tale of a man who escaped the brutal bonds of slavery. He built a settlement for fugitive slaves and a school where their children could receive a proper education. His memoirs were a key inspiration for Uncle Tom's Cabin, the best-selling novel of the 19th century, which Abraham Lincoln credited with starting the Civil War. Josiah Henson's efforts on behalf of the Underground Railroad helped more than 100 slaves escape to freedom. He was received as an honored guest by the President of the United States, and he even traveled to England and met the Queen twice. But I'm getting ahead of the story. Josiah Henson was born June 15, 1789, in Charles County, Maryland, about a mile from Port Tobacco. As Negroes of African ancestry, Josiah's mother and father were property of local farmers. Yes, Josiah's parents were slaves, and so was Josiah. One day, while working in the fields on his master's farm, Josiah's father heard a woman screaming. He arrived on the scene to find the white overseer attacking his wife. Josiah's father would have killed the overseer except for his wife's pleadings and the overseer's promise that nothing would ever be said of the matter. But the overseer had lied. You know, when he was, when he was really young, he, I think three or four years of age, he saw his father um, being brought to the center of the plantation and put, in, put on display. And his punishment for having touched a, a white person, because in those days it was illegal for a black to touch a white person. His father's punishment was that he was lashed a hundred times and then his, his right ear was tacked to a post and then cut off with a knife. And just imagine having to witness that at such a young age. And his father was put up on an auction block and sold down to Alabama because he was seen as somewhat of a troublemaker on the plantation. Young Josiah's troubles were just beginning. For only a year or so after his father was sold, his master was killed in an accident. In a drunken stupor, he fell from his horse into a shallow creek and was too drunk to save himself. And as a result of his death, it became necessary to sell the estate and the slaves. As was common in those days, Josiah's entire family was put on the auction block and sold to the highest bidder. The first image I think of when I, I think of Henson is I think of him being up on the auction block um, and being sold away from his brothers and sisters and, and his mother and dad and how heart-wrenching that must have been. He was sold away from, from most of his family. His mother pleaded and pleaded with um, the man who purchased him to, to buy her as well. But um, he was separated from his mother and became ill under his new master. And the masters had some foresight in knowing that a boy would get stronger if he had the love of his mother with him. And so he was sold back to, um, with his mother. And under her tutelage, you know, he really got better. And he was really a strong, helped to build his strong character that he had throughout his life. Slaves were supplied with the barest minimum of food and clothing. They lived in single room huts with only packed dirt for a floor and 10 or 12 adults and children would crowd into each hut to sleep. The huts provided little protection from the dampness and cold, and they did not permit the common decencies of life. Yet, in spite of these dreadful conditions, Josiah grew to be a robust and vigorous young man. 
The other slaves and even his master called Josiah a wonderfully smart fellow. Josiah had a curious mind and he wanted to learn to read. But educating slaves was frowned on even in states where it wasn't expressly against the law. Josiah's master caught him one day with a, with a spelling book and he beat him unconscious with a walking stick. As cruel as the master was, he recognized that Josiah was a born leader, intelligent and well liked by the other slaves. When Josiah was just 18, the master decided to save the salary of a white overseer and assign Josiah the responsibility of supervising the field hands. Josiah was both popular and efficient, and under his kind leadership, the slaves worked harder than they had ever worked under the whip of a white overseer. And more importantly, they produced more abundant crops. Another, even more important event would happen when Josiah was 18. Josiah's mother was a very spiritual woman. Um, one of the things that she liked to quote the most was the Lord's Prayer. Um, she could not read herself, but she knew many scriptures which she taught to Josiah. She heard about this meeting about four miles away and she asked Josiah to go. So he happily went to this um, home and he was afraid to go in. So he stood outside the porch and he listened to the minister. This minister was preaching from Hebrews 2.9. And as the sermon went on, it talked about how Jesus not only loved the masters, but he also loved the slaves. He thought about that over and over again. In fact, on his way home, that went over and over and over in his head that Jesus freed not only the masters, but he also freed the slaves. And he stopped and he prayed to God and he asked God to just look over him and watch over him and to just keep him. And God granted that. At that moment, he felt a revelation. And I think he knew then that God had him on a mission. And from that point on, Josiah was determined to help anybody that he could and to just move on in life with a more and a more courageous and different attitude. After Josiah's awakening to this new life, he began to preach the gospel. Although he was not formally educated, he learned by listening to other great preachers the oratory of skills that he would need later on. Josiah Henson's faith was deep, but he was not yet free. And for a slave, even an act of kindness could lead to punishment. Josiah's master used to go out and drink and gamble a lot. Um, he used to take Josiah with him just to make sure that he made it back correctly. On one particular day, there was a big commotion and Josiah heard that there was a lot of noise going on. So he broke his way through the crowd to find out what was happening. Well, he saw his master in a brawl and tried to help him out. In turn of all that, he hit a white overseer who became very upset. The overseer saw Josiah several days later and had some slaves with him and made the slaves hold Josiah down. The white overseer beat Josiah with a, a rail of, of, of a fence and beat him to the point where he broke both of his shoulders. Josiah never healed from that because he was not allowed to go to the doctor or to receive medicine. So for the rest of his life, he was not able to, to lift his arms over his head. When Josiah's master found out what happened, he was very upset that his property had been damaged. So he took the white overseer to court. Well, back in those days, Slaves were not allowed to speak in court. They were not allowed to give a testimony. So the white overseer basically went free. In 1825, Josiah's master was ordered by the court to sell all his property at auction to satisfy his debts. The master's property included Josiah, Charlotte, and their four sons. The master concocted a plan to hide the slaves from his creditors by having Josiah take them to his brother's plantation in Kentucky. While on his route to Kentucky, 
he passes through Cincinnati. Well, Ohio was a free state, and by them being in Cincinnati, the free blacks there tried to convince Josiah Henson to let the slaves go and to find jobs and to be free. Here was their opportunity to do such a thing. But Josiah Henson, by being a loyal man, kept his word that he would deliver those slaves to Kentucky as he had promised. A great man of Christian character. So he kept his word to his master there. And those later on, those slaves were taken into the deep south where he learned later on that those conditions were so uh, brutal that he later regretted that he missed the opportunity to set those people free as well as himself. And I think that's something he regretted. Josiah was haunted by regret over the day in Cincinnati when he denied his friends their chance at liberty. And Josiah still believed that he must obtain freedom by purchase. He saw it as the only honorable way. Yet he worried that he had been unfair to deny his comrades a chance to seek freedom on their own terms. Later, he would write, in keeping faith with my master, I betrayed my friends. There were a number of ways that uh, slaves could get their freedom. And if you didn't run away on the Underground Railroad and try and steal your freedom, many people um, tried to save up the money that their, their, their masters paid them. And many plantations, you didn't get paid any money, but some you did. And Henson happened to work on one where he was paid just a little bit of money, but it wouldn't have been enough for him to save his freedom in, in, a, in a good amount of time. So what he did was um, he had to make his way back to his master's plantation in Maryland. And what he did was use his, this opportunity to stop in little towns along the way. And as he was going through Cincinnati, he did happen to meet up with a preacher, a Methodist preacher. And it was this man who ordained him into the Methodist Episcopal faith. And he encouraged Henson to, to purchase a good suit of clothes and to get some transportation by way of a horse and use this trip to speak and try and raise money for his cause. And Henson, by the time he'd arrived in Maryland, he'd saved up uh, 300, almost $350. And that was the price that his master had told him it would cost him to purchase his freedom. So Henson sits there, signs his X on the manumission papers, and makes his way back to Kentucky to uh, get his wife and kids and, and head out on a new life of freedom. But when he arrived um, at the plantation in Kentucky, the manumission papers stated that you're $650 short of the freedom. And his owner had taken advantage of the fact that Henson couldn't read or write. And that was really the beginning of Henson realizing that his owner was not an honorable man and no matter how honorable Henson would be throughout his, his life on the plantation, he wasn't going to get the same respect back. And I think that's really when he started to really yearn for his freedom. Josiah's master in Maryland and his brother in Kentucky began to argue about who owned Josiah. It seemed the only way to resolve the argument was to sell Josiah and divide the proceeds between the brothers. When Josiah was told that he was to go with the master's son to New Orleans to sell some produce, Josiah knew in his heart that the real reason he was being taken to New Orleans was to be sold. On the boat, Josiah knew he had to escape. So one rainy night while the men slept, he crept into their cabin intending to kill them all and escape to the north. He came to the master's son first. So he raised the ax, ready to strike. And suddenly the horror of what he was about to do overcame him. He simply was not willing to commit murder, no matter what cruelties or evils might lie ahead. In New Orleans, the master's son became gravely ill. So instead of putting Josiah up for auction, he begged Josiah to take him home. Josiah stayed with the young master and nursed him back to health as they traveled back to Kentucky. Josiah reflected bitterly on his betrayal by his master and his brother. Josiah had been loyal to both brothers far beyond the call of his duty as a slave. 
yet they had shown no loyalty to him. Had it not been for God's intervention, Josiah would have been sold in New Orleans, never to see Charlotte and the boys again. Suddenly, Josiah felt as though he had been relieved of any further obligation to his masters. Once this decision was made, a weight seemed lifted from his shoulders. From that moment on, Josiah committed to do everything in his power to rescue himself and his family from the wicked conspiracy of slavery. After returning to Kentucky, Josiah made his plans. On a dark night, a fellow slave rode the Henson family across the Ohio River. When they stepped onto the Indiana shore, there could be no turning back. The older boys could walk, but Josiah carried the two younger sons in a knapsack Charlotte had sewn for this purpose. The straps dug into the flesh of Josiah's crippled shoulders, but Josiah was a man of uncommon strength. It was a two-week journey to Cincinnati where Josiah had made friends on his preaching tour. By day, the runaways hid in the woods and tried to sleep. At night, they walked by the light of the stars. Josiah's shoulders ached from carrying the two youngest children, and by morning, he would be exhausted. Once Josiah and his family escaped across the river to Indiana, they had a very long journey. His wife made him a garment to go over his shoulders to carry his two children, which was still very painful for him because of the beating that he had. He was still not able to lift his hands over his head. His older two children walked along with them. Well, they were not able to um, travel by day. They only could travel by night. And at the end of this long journey, they finally got to a point where they were very, very hungry and they could not go on any longer. So Josiah took the chance to go to a farm to get some food for his family. It was a very, very kind woman gave him some salt venison to take back to his family. And they ate that with delight. They ate it with some relish. But because of all of the salt, it made him very, very thirsty. So once again, he had to go and take a chance and go to the river to try to get some water. Because it was such a distance, um, he couldn't bring the water back because he was trying to bring it in his hat, which had holes in it. So he had to think of another way. Um, he went to the river and decided to use his shoes. And he took the shoes back with, filled with water to give to his children, which were very delighted after getting the water. And the look on their faces just made him very proud. Years later, he made a statement that out of all of the places that he had been, out of all the people that he had seen and the wonderful fine things that he had been through, it was never a comparison to the looks on his children's faces from drinking water from his shoes. After weeks of walking and exhausted from the journey, they reached Lake Erie. There, Josiah found a jovial Scottish ship captain who agreed to carry the family to Canada. At dusk, the fugitives boarded the ship and sailed to Buffalo. The next morning, the captain pointed to some trees on the other shore. You see those trees, he said? They grow on free soil. As soon as your feet touch that, you're a free man. Be a good fellow, won't you? Yes, sir, Josiah promised. I'll use my freedom well. I don't think that uh, Henson's crossing over into freedom was any much different than anybody else that had been 41 years a slave and had suddenly realized, here I am, I'm free. And when he crossed from Buffalo over to Fort Erie here in Canada, and landed on the free side. He, he jumped down, grabbed fistfuls of soil and started throwing them up in, in the air because he was so excited that he was free. And people watching, standing by, just thought he must have been a madman, but uh, he was mad about his freedom. He found it. And it must have been quite a shock to him when he, he finally settled down and, and looked about him and realized, we have nothing. We're starting from scratch. What are we gonna do? And uh, that's when he, he found work with a farmer, a man by the name of Hibbard in Fort Erie, and 
at that time he had no shelter, so what uh, the farmer had to do was just clean out a pigsty, and, and Henson moved his family in there, and, and that's when they began their new life of freedom. He found work there, his kids began attending school there, began to learn to read and write, and Henson, imagine 42 years old, not learning how to read or write, he relied on his son uh, to help teach him by candlelight, just the basics of reading and writing. Henson said he never did really get a good grasp for it, but he could understand a few words here and there, and uh, he had his son, his son to thank for that. As Josiah began to learn to read, his new knowledge made him realize even more deeply how ignorant he had been in his younger years. Most of the fugitive slaves still pouring into Canada had grown up under the same disgraceful conditions. The Reverend Josiah Henson was now looked up to as a leader. He worried that most of the former slaves were too easily satisfied. They were so overjoyed with their new freedom that they were willing to work for whatever wages they were offered, and some white employers took advantage of them. So the Reverend Henson sermons did not deal exclusively with religion. They also included advice about such practical matters as planting and harvesting of crops. The Reverend Henson reminded his fellow former slaves, we must remember that we are living in a new and undeveloped country. Let us benefit from the example set by white pioneers. Instead of always working for hire, let us save our money and buy land of our own. When Reverend Henson arrived in Canada, certainly he could have just uh, purchased some land and, and built a house and settled down with his family, but he always knew that there were other people still suffering in the South, and he wanted to build a haven for them for when they arrived in Canada. So what he did was uh, he made friends, abolitionist friends, and one of the men that he was lucky to uh, befriend is Hiram Wilson, who was a graduate of Oberlin uh, College in the United States, and Hiram Wilson was noted for um, starting up different uh, settlements like Henson had in mind, places for blacks to help better themselves. And so they, they helped uh, raise over $1,500 um, on a trip to England to raise money for the, the settlement here, and they also made friends with um, wealthy philanthropists in uh, New York State one by the name of James Canning Fuller. And with all that seed money, they were able to purchase 200 acres of property here in, in Dresden. And they started a school called the British American Institute. They named it the British American Institute because they'd received funding from England and from these abolitionists in the Northern American states as well. They built a sawmill, they built a grist mill, a rope factory, a brickyard, a whole bunch of different um, industries so that they would be able to better themselves and really be self-sufficient. And the school really began to flourish. One of the main reasons Henson decided to settle here in Dresden was when he and uh, some of his other partners began scouting out this territory, they were struck by how fertile the land is here. And covering all of this uh, 200 acres of land was this dense thicket of black walnut trees. And of course they knew that uh, furniture made out of black walnut that would command a high price. So they began clearing the land and Henson saw, thought, how are we going to get our name out? How can we, how can we promote this, this settlement? And he used the Great Exhibition in uh, London, England in 1851 as an opportunity to do just that. He crossed the ocean, his very first uh, trip over, and took with him four beautifully polished black walnut boards that his students had polished here at the Institute and uh, set up his booth at the, the Crystal Palace. We know that he met the Queen, Queen Victoria, on his trip over to uh, England and initially he had seen her, not actually met her, but seen her at the Crystal Palace during the Great Exhibition. She walked by and uh, noticed his boards and said to one of her aides, was he really a slave from uh, the United States? And her aide assured her that indeed he was, and I think that really impressed her that a man that grew up for 42 years with nothing is here in her country amongst some of the, the most wealthiest people around the world, some of the most successful people 
And here he is with product as well. Josiah was surprised that he would impress the queen and had no idea that his life would eventually help change the conscience of a nation. Freedom in Christ became his passion for all people, those oppressed by the sin of slavery and the slavery of sin. Josiah became a leading speaker in the anti-slavery movement, and his activities with the Underground Railroad helped free 118 slaves. In Josiah Henson's memoirs, Harriet Beecher Stowe found inspiration for her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the best-selling novel of the 19th century, which Abraham Lincoln credited with starting the Civil War. By the time Josiah Henson preached his last sermon at the age of 93, he had traveled widely to spread the gospel and to speak out against slavery, not only in Canada and the United States, but also in England, where he met Queen Victoria. In the first episode of our story, we follow Josiah Henson's first 50 years. Born into slavery, Josiah's earliest memory was of the brutal beating his father received for defending his wife from an attack by a white overseer. At age 18, a sermon changed Josiah's view of God, himself, and slavery. The text was Hebrews 2, verse 9, and Josiah was deeply moved to learn that Jesus died for everyone even slaves. Freedom in Christ became his passion for all people, those oppressed by the sin of slavery and the slavery of sin. By his hard work and intelligence, Josiah became an overseer, and because he treated the other slaves with kindness, they produced twice the crops they had produced under the cruelty of white overseers. After saving his master from a dangerous tavern brawl, Josiah was savagely beaten. Both of his shoulder blades were broken and he was crippled for life. Despite Josiah's loyalty, his master betrayed him and sent him south to be sold at auction. Josiah could not bear the thought of being separated forever from his wife and children, so he and his family risked their lives and escaped to Canada. Near Dresden, Ontario, Josiah established the Dawn Settlement and built the first manual training school for fugitive slaves. To raise funds for the new community, Josiah traveled throughout the northeastern states and to England. Soon he was a sought-after speaker in the anti-slavery movement and became active in the Underground Railroad. Henson is noted here in Canada for his work um, as an author, as an abolitionist, and as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. He went back and forth a number of times rescuing other blacks that uh, were trying to make their way here to Canada. He's credited with bringing 118 people out of freedom, out of slavery, I should say. Um, but there's not, he doesn't go into great detail in his autobiography about those accounts. And it makes you wonder if when his, his autobiography was published, that was at a time when slavery was still, still in effect in the United States. And I doubt that they wanted to go into great detail about what routes they were using, what, um, who they were bringing out, and what plantations they were visiting. Henson going back into the United States was taking such a huge risk because when he was doing this work on the Underground Railroad, slavery was still still in practice and he, if he'd been uh, captured at any point he could have been uh, taken back to a plantation but um, for him to risk his life going back and forth on that on that railroad was it's amazing to me that he would take such risks for just to, to help others that he knew were in need. Josiah Henson had his memoirs published in 1849 and that came about as a result of him being invited to speak to the Boston Anti-Slavery Society. Henson was encouraged to dictate his, his autobiography and life story and it was printed up in a little pamphlet form. At the headquarters of the Boston Anti-Slavery Society, Josiah's slim volume was displayed alongside the more imposing works of Frederick Douglass, William Wells Brown, and Theodore Weld. One reader who was moved by Josiah's story would soon write a book of her own, a book that would change the course of history. Her name was Harriet Beecher Stowe. 
We're here in the front parlor of the Harriet Beecher Stowe House in Hartford, Connecticut. This is the house that Harriet lived for the last 27 odd years of her life, her retirement home, if you will. Harriet was um, the sixth of 11 children. She was one of the prominent Beecher family, and the Beechers were influential in all different kinds of social reform throughout the 19th century. They're really the equivalent of the Kennedy family today. Um, if it was educational reform, expanded social rights, expanded civil rights, um, re even religious reform, and certainly uh, women's rights, all of those things, there was one or another member of the Beecher family involved. Today, if somebody wants to influence society, they go into politics. But in the 19th century, even up to the 1920s or so, if somebody wanted to influence society, they went into the clergy. And Lyman Beecher, Harriet's father, was a minister. All seven of Harriet's brothers were ministers, and Harriet even married um, a theologian. So she was well surrounded by people who were moving and shaking the 19th century. It wasn't just the men in the Beecher family who were expected to be involved in social reform. All of the children were expected to find out what they were supposed to do. Lyman and his wife Roxana raised their children to believe that God had given every person on earth a job and it was everybody's duty to find out what that job was and then to implement it. Harriet came to believe that her job was to be a literary woman. Um, in time she came to believe that her calling was to write a novel to explain slavery to the whole world, to make the whole world see what an injustice slavery was. Uncle Tom's Cabin started um, as a serial in a newspaper, in an abolitionist newspaper, just like most 19th century novels were started as in serial form. It turned out to be 48 installments, and it took about a year to, pub to write the whole thing. She was researching it literally as she wrote. Um, once it came out in book form, it was a phenomenal and almost overnight bestseller. It sold 10,000 copies within a month. Um, over 300,000 copies just in the United States by the end of the year, nearly a million copies year-round, uh, worldwide rather, and it was just, nobody expected it. It was the biggest bestseller in the 19th century. Only the Bible outsold Uncle Tom's Cabin, and it had a profound impact here in the United States and around the world as well. Uncle Tom's Cabin, despite being this phenomenal bestseller, was also a very divisive book. Pro-slavery forces said that Mrs. Stowe was making things up, that she'd never traveled through the South, had no idea of what slavery was really about. Um, Far-left abolitionists said that she had not painted an awful enough picture. People who were very involved in the Congregational Church said, oh, you're writing about things no lady should write about. So even though lots of people were buying the book and were reading the book, there were people out there both black and white who didn't care for the book at the time, although Frederick Douglass said it was the right book at the right time. Just to give you an idea of how brave Mrs. Stowe was to have written that book when she did, um, you, you can imagine how the people in the South felt about her writing this, this novel. One day she went down to her mailbox and there was a little envelope in the box. She took it back up to her house and opened it up, and if you can imagine, there was a black person's ear inside the envelope. A slave owner from the South had cut off a slave's ear and mailed it to her as a form of a death threat. And as I say, that didn't, that didn't stop her. After the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin as a book in 1852, a number of critics claimed that Stowe didn't know what she was talking about. And as someone who was in her heart probably a frustrated historian and a frustrated minister, she actually enjoyed that challenge of being asked to cite her sources. Her response was a 900-page volume called The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, in which she looked at every character and wrote at least a paragraph, if not two or three pages, talking about the sources that she used to create those various characters. In The Key, she went through every case that was questioned or challenged, every character, and she cited her sources. She said, I knew this person, or my brother sent me a letter describing this incident. This incident was published in a newspaper in Cincinnati, and so she went through line by line virtually saying where she had received her inspiration. When she got to Tom, the title character, she mentioned a number of different inspirations for that person, and she concluded the 
three or four page description of Tom by saying the best known source was the memoirs of the venerable Reverend Josiah Henson, now a minister up in Canada. She went on, and here I'm paraphrasing, to say that, that Henson's life actually excelled Tom's in a number of the events that happened in his own life. Uncle Tom's Cabin was such a big bestseller and such a phenomenon that spin-offs became part of that phenomenon. There were little ceramic pieces that showed the different characters. There were textiles. There were different costume pieces. You could buy a St. Clair hat or a little Eva white dress. There were, was wallpaper with scenes from Uncle Tom's Cabin on it. But the most important spin-off and the one that had the longest lasting legacy on American culture were the plays. Um, even before the book was finished, people started writing plays based on Uncle Tom's Cabin. Copyright laws of the 19th century didn't permit Stowe to protect her characters or even the name Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so people came in, used the name Uncle Tom's Cabin on the plays that they were producing took the more dramatic parts and created a theatrical piece that had much more minstrel show tradition than much based on the characters that Stowe herself had created. So Tom, in Stowe's book, who was started out as a very young man, a very principled man who truly was willing to be sold further into slavery as opposed to running away to freedom in, nor in the North. He was willing to be sold into slavery to protect his own family, to keep his own family united, and then later dies in order to protect um, two slave women who were hiding, and in order not to deny his own Christian faith. Um, that's a very powerful and strong character that Stowe created. All of that's hard to portray on stage, and so instead, playwrights and theater producers just took the, the snazzy parts of the story. They took the dramatic scenes, and once the Civil War was over, they actually dropped any references to slavery because why talk about that? And what happens is that this incredibly powerful book gets turned into a minstrel show and it perpetuates incredibly degrading stereotypes. And there's been one historian who suggested that for every two people that read the book, five went to see the play. And so the plays become part of the lasting legacy of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Naturally, people are going to the theaters to be entertained. They want to laugh. That's what brings them out. And so because Uncle Tom's Cabin was such a disturbing story, full of a lot of heartbreak, they changed the character of Uncle Tom into this, this flunky who, who would shuffle on stage and his, his vocal speech, his, his um, physical traits and mannerisms were exaggerated to the point that they were comical. And people assumed that, well, if an Uncle Tom is a person that's just laughable and, and a sellout of their race, because that's what they changed Uncle Tom to be, he was a sellout of his race in these, in these Tom shows. People didn't want to be associated with that type of character. That term, Uncle Tom, doesn't become a slur until probably about the 1930s. It's currently under scholarly debate as to when it first starts being used as a slur. But by the 1930s, um, black academics, black intelligentsia are using it to describe other members of the African American community that are not as radical as they feel that things should be. Um, the term increases in usage throughout the 20th century um, and becomes then part of, again, our wider cultural understanding of the book and of the story, so that by the 1960s, Uncle Tom's Cabin is no longer even being taught in most public schools because it's a bad book and not a good book. The character Uncle Tom is certainly the best remembered one in, in Stowe's book. And she used him in a number of different ways. She really, as she said herself, saw Uncle Tom's Cabin as her sermon to America on the evils of slavery. She called it a Jeremiah, a warning to the nation that if things are not um, stopped, if slavery doesn't end, then God will smite the country and the United States of America will be destroyed. She was pretty prophetic because the Civil War started 10 years after the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin.
But in her story, she uses, or she believed she was using, Tom as a Christ figure. Tom is the one who promotes Christianity in the book. Tom is the one who dies so that others will understand all the evils of slavery, thus redeeming other people from being slaves themselves um, or for other people from perpetuating the evil of being involved in the slave trade. Um, he never denies his faith and that's one of the reasons he dies is that he is so firmly convinced and convicted in his own Christianity that he, he tells Simon Legree that you may own my body but never my soul. The unprecedented success of Uncle Tom's Cabin would forever link Harriet Beecher Stowe and Josiah Henson. Some of her fame rubbed off on him, and he was in even greater demand as a speaker among anti-slavery groups in New England. Josiah became more and more identified with the character of Uncle Tom, though he himself never made that claim. He did not need to. Mrs. Stowe had done that in her key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. In 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected President of the United States. Even before his inauguration, seven southern states seceded from the Union and set up a government for a separate nation called the Confederate States of America. In April 1861, when Confederate troops bombarded Fort Sumter, the American Civil War began. It would last an agonizing four years and leave more than 600,000 dead. In 1862, as the war raged on, Harriet Beecher Stowe was invited to meet Lincoln at the White House. As she was greeted by the president, his words took her by surprise. When Abraham Lincoln met Mrs. Stowe, he allegedly greeted her with the words, so you're the little lady who wrote the book that started this great war, reflecting the profound impact that the book Uncle Tom's Cabin had on the American psyche, that people, it forced them to either be pro-slavery or against slavery and helped propel the nation towards civil war. That same year, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which announced that slaves should be forever free. At last, on April 9th, 1865, Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, signaling the end of the conflict. But just five days later, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And for the Henson family, there was an added sorrow. Tom, who as a 12-year-old boy had taught his father to read, had enlisted on an American warship as soon as Negroes were permitted to join the Union forces. Josiah's firstborn was never heard from again. Presumably, he had been lost at sea. Henson traveled over to England three times in his life, and on his last trip over to England, he was uh, greeted by all the nobility, and one of the gentlemen that he met was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he said to Henson, after having spoken with him for some time, he said, I'm really impressed with your your grasp of, the, of the, the language and how well spoken you are and where did you get your education? What university did you go to? And Henson's witty reply was, I graduated, your grace, from the University of Adversity. We know that he met the Queen, Queen Victoria, on his trip over to uh, England and years later when she had heard of Henson's um, attachment to the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, she sent out a telegram inviting him and his, his author, his editor, and as well uh, his wife to come and visit her at, at uh, the palace. So you can imagine what, how he must have felt. Here's the Queen of England wanting to meet me, you know, formerly a slave, me who had nothing. And so when he met Queen Victoria, she greeted him by saying, why well, Mr. Henson, I'm, I expected to see somebody on crutches, but I'm I'm pleased to see somebody as well preserved and good looking as yourself. And he said to her, my sovereign, that is what all the ladies say. Though Queen Victoria did not always appreciate facetious remarks, she seemed pleased by Josiah's quick reply. She asked him to sign his name in her private album, and she in turn presented him with an autographed portrait of herself. <laughs> 
During the months he spent in England and Scotland, Josiah Henson spoke no fewer than 99 times, telling overflow audiences the story of his escape from slavery. After their visit with the Queen, the Hensons went to Scotland, where they were welcomed as warmly as they had been in England. Josiah had grown accustomed to being introduced as Uncle Tom, but it bothered him when some literal-minded readers called him an imposter. They had been deeply touched by the book's convincing description of Tom's death. How could it be, they wondered, that the original of that character was still alive? Finally, at a meeting in Glasgow, Josiah determined to set the record straight. His speech was quoted at length in the Dumfries and Galloway Standard for April 25, 1877. Josiah told his audience, Now allow me to say that my name is not Tom, and never was Tom. My name is Josiah Henson. Always was and always will be. I never changed my colors. <laughs> this brought laughter from the crowd. You have read and heard some person say that Uncle Tom is dead. A great many have come to me in this country and asked me if I was not dead. I heard you were dead and read where you were. Well, says I, I heard so too, but I never believed it yet. <laughs> More laughter from the crowd. I thought in all probability I would have found out as soon as anybody else. At that comment, the crowd broke into applause. They have forgotten that Mrs. Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin is a novel, and it must have seemed the glorious finish to that novel that she should kill her hero. You remember that when this novel of Mrs. Stowe's came out, it shook Americans almost out of their shoes and out of their shirts. The crowd laughs again. They came to the conclusion that the whole thing was a falsehood, and so she brought out her key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. She told them where they would find a man named Josiah Henson. She said I was a venerable fellow, in which she was not much mistaken, for I am an old man preaching in Canada. Finally, Josiah reminded his listeners that he was not responsible for anything that Mrs. Stowe had written in her novel, but only for what she had written about him in her key. Though proud to be called Uncle Tom, he also was proud of his own identity. The following year, 1878, the Hensons traveled to Washington, D.C. Frederick Douglass, who, like Josiah Henson, had been born into slavery, had been appointed United States Marshal for the District of Columbia, and he had written to the President on behalf of the Hensons. A year after they had met Queen Victoria, they were received by President Rutherford B. Hayes, whom Josiah referred to as His Excellency. For a man born into slavery, Josiah Henson had come a long way. It was a journey that could not be measured in miles. His role here at the Don Settlement was as a spiritual head. He gave everybody the spiritual food that they needed to get them through from one day to the next. And he preached every Sunday of his life. He preached right up until almost the day he died. About six weeks before he died, he was still preaching, 93 years of age and uh, just still going strong. And here, here at Uncle Tom's Cabin Museum, we have the actual pulpit that he preached from. And when Henson died, you knew that he was going to a better place and he was going to a happy place. He, he worked tirelessly throughout his life trying to, to better himself and to better the black race. And in the end, I think that he really did achieve everything that he'd set out to do. In 1983, Canada created a postage stamp to honor the 100th anniversary of Josiah Henson's death. The stamp combines a portrait of Josiah with a symbolic representation of the Underground Railroad. You knew that he was well regarded from the, the funeral ceremony that took place. It was the largest one in Dresden up until that point. There were hundreds of horse-drawn carriages that came out to the Henson family cemetery plot. And beautiful, beautiful stone was, was uh, put in the, in the Henson Cemetery to mark where Henson had uh, passed on. And uh, there's a beautiful scripture on the, on the, the monument. Uh, he said, I know my Redeemer liveth from the book of Job. And 
he had a part of a, the rest of heaven. It was his favorite spiritual, and he had it inscribed on his tombstone. And it's faded to this t today, but uh, it says, There is a land of pure delight where saints immortal reign. Infinite day excludes the night, and pleasures banish pain. Indeed, his, his Redeemer did live, and he's up there with him now.